Hello, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is an ancient spiritual practice from India. It means being in reality together. I give Satsang live every Wednesday and Sunday night in Portland, Maine. This Dharma talk was recorded during one of our Wednesday night gatherings. Please visit jayakula.org to learn more about the teachings. You can find video satsangs on Jayakula's YouTube channel, and my books are all available on Amazon.com. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. Okay. So, welcome everybody. And we're going to talk tonight about sickness and health in relationship to the larger spiritual view of Kashmir Shaivism, or just more loosely what are called non-dual traditions. The first thing we want to think about when we're wanting to get into the view of sickness and health is to make a clear distinction about how the body is treated in what are called transcendental or more dualistic traditions versus traditions that are loosely called non-dual. We have probably some idea, if we've been on the planet for a while, that there are some religious traditions that discourage us from paying a lot of attention to our bodies. And what this is based on is some view that body is radically different from spirit. And the view that the subject of spirituality or religious traditions is spirit and not matter. In some and many world traditions, there's less emphasis on taking care of the body and maybe even in some more extreme forms of those traditions an emphasis actually on chastising the body right doing penance hello how are you so we were just talking about that in many traditions spiritual traditions there's a division made in between spirit and matter. And that that fundamental view that there's a real distinction between spirit and matter gives rise to denigration of the body and less emphasis on taking care of your body and certainly less emphasis on taking care of your body as part of a spiritual practice. I mean, maybe we have to take care of our bodies just so we can limp along through this life. <laughs> <laughs> so we just want to know what universe we're in in the direct realization traditions there is no division between spirit and matter spirit and matter are simply names that we give to different kinds of experiences and matter is just as much an experience as something we call spiritual or more subtle. They just exist on a continuum from more subtle experiences to more gross and embodied experiences. And there's no gap between them. Everything is Shiva nature. So if in the direct realization traditions we say we love God, that means loving ourselves. That means loving our bodies. That means caring for our bodies. So the overarching view in the direct realization traditions is that you take care of your body as you would take care of any other aspect of the creation. And in fact, Anandamayama said, you have no right not to care for your body. She also said that this is the first step in understanding how to care for your body, the properly as someone who is consciously engaged 
in a practice of self-realization. Consider yourself an integral part of nature. So, number one, she says, caring for your body means learning to experience yourself as an integral part of nature, not as something separate from nature as a whole. Uh, that just implies automatically that we have to expand our sense of identity in order to properly care for our bodies as people consciously engaged in spiritual practice. Let there be stress on nature's work, she says, or we could say nature's ways, or on her laws, the laws of nature, instead of your own self as the embodiment of your sense perceptions. So she says, let's look to the larger laws of nature, not just to our small identity as somehow being the owners of our sense perceptions, these separate little pinballs of human humanity. <laughs> right? <clears throat> that in order to properly care for our bodies, we have to see ourselves as being an aspect of and answerable to the laws of nature as a whole, the bigger picture. This implies that we are a continuum of nature, that that which governs nature as a, as a whole, night and day, seasons, <laughs> right? All the gunas, the different qualities of nature, dryness, wetness, etc., all those different qualities of nature, that all those things are aspects of ourselves. And then in order to take care of ourselves, we have to pay attention to ourselves as part of the continuum of nature. That we're in a relationship of receptivity. We're not just these little atoms or pinballs. <laughs> that we need to adapt. Nature's constantly changing. I don't know what anybody else does anywhere else, but here, you know, someone says, here, take this vitamin. 20 years later, you're still taking it. You haven't adapted. You haven't ever checked in to see if you still need that vitamin. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> this happened to me many, many years ago. I you know, read something about salt is bad. So I stopped <laughs> eating salt. And then you know, 10 years later, the doctor said to me, do you eat salt? I said, no. He's like, well, you really need some salt. <laughs> So seeing ourselves in the context of nature means that we're constantly feeling ourselves in relationship to our environment, and we're feeling the environment of ourselves in its openness to the rest of the world. Can I interject something there? So from the Ayurvedic perspective, this is what constitutes actual freedom, that we have this ability to be responsive to nature and to the changes and vicissitudes of nature that the idea that we can do whatever we want and that's freedom is actually a form of entrapment and that to be to be in this constant communication with nature and the changes of nature is actually what we want to achieve as, as an idea of freedom. Beautiful. Ma actually defined what healthiness is. That makes it very easy for me. <laughs> I'm very happy about that. She said, healthy is what helps us to discover our real nature. Unhealthy is what further obscures our real nature. Wow, that just puts it... <laughs> but it could be anything then. Every aspect of life. <laughs> when we're talking about healthy, we're not just talking about, we don't, you know, some illnesses. We're talking about our whole life. Healthy is what helps us to move towards the discovery of our real nature. Healthy relationships, healthy work, healthy eating, healthy sleeping, you know, uh, healthy practicing. Everything can be 
brought under this this one maxim, right? It seems like so many people are like really consciously doing things to obscure their real nature. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's called karma. <laughs> that's that's karma that's moving us towards greater states of tension and the reason people do that is because it's pleasurable we want fulfillment we want sweetness we want to feel loved and we want all those things that go along with self-realization but when we don't yet understand what uh, when we don't yet have a taste of our real nature, when we don't yet understand the cosmic uh, sized aspects of what we want, we go for the little aspect. So, you know, we go for the sweetness of the donut instead of the sweetness of God realization. But it's all the same seeking, same thing. You know, whether they're sticking a needle in their arm or doing sadhana in a cave in the Himalayas. They're going for exactly the same thing. But there's just, lim when someone's sticking a needle in their arm, they're just having very limited view. They haven't yet correctly identified what it is they're longing for. I was thinking of it in the context of so much of what I'm, I work with, which is such a strong paradigm in Western culture about romantic love. Like if I, if I have this partner, if I feel loved in this way, then that's the love that will satisfy me. Mm -hmm. And to talk to people about anything else is like, you piss them off. Yeah. <laughs> well, that takes a lot of skill because yeah. that will satisfy some people. Uh -huh. okay. Temporarily. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it takes a lot of skill to know when it's best just to let someone fulfill yeah. that karma right. and when they're ready to go a little wider view. Right? But sometimes the best thing is just to make people comfortable right. and, and help let them go through whatever it is they need to go through and fulfill in this more limited way. And everything always opens out. Yeah. Everything always opens out. So in the direct realization traditions, no matter what is happening with our body, in sickness or in health, we are bringing that onto the path. No matter what is happening with our body, we, were, we are making that an aspect of our <coughs> conscious efforts to self-realize. In all cases, illness and health, both. So in this sense, neglect of our body, neglect of our health, or neglect of healthy living, even not necessarily just related to our body, but neglect of healthy work, neglect of healthy relationships. Neglect interferes with our practice. Self-care in all these different realms, including our physical health, whether in good health or ill health, is our practice. Self-care is our practice in any condition that we happen to find ourselves in. Ma, if, if many of you know that Ananda Mai Ma always had uh, students feed her, right? And maybe it seems a little dopey to some people. <laughs> but she always said, I'm your little daughter. Don't call me Ma, I'm your little daughter. Because we hold our children in our hearts constantly as our most intimate loves. Whereas our mother, might, we might have her at a little bit more distance. And when we take care of our children, that is one way of learning how to take care of everything. So Ma had people feed her as, as a little girl would be fed by her parents, in part because she wanted ev her, everyone to learn how to care for everything. That was a, a gateway, feeding her. So in the same sense, um, the universe, the, uh, when I say universe, I don't mean like, I don't mean like in a scientific sense. I mean all of reality is your body. 
your body doesn't end here, right? And we learn that from the very beginning, we start doing mantra, we start feeling a little more porous, right? When you're more awake, you'll really start to feel that everything is an aspect of one body. And learning to care for your own body is a gateway towards learning to care for that larger body. <laughs> There's a, a wonderful instruction that some of my students know that Chogam Trungpa Rinpoche liked to give about meditation practice. And he would say, meditation should be not too loose and not too tight. And in the same way, self-care should be not too weak and not too strong. If we care for our health too weakly, if we're too lax about it or we let our debilitating karmas take over too much, then we're on the road to uh, breakdowns that interfere with our practice. When we are narcissistically, to use a psychological term, when we're folk too rigid about our self-care and too narrowly focused on caring for our body in particular, that is coming from a sense of separation and it reinforces a sense of separation. So if what we really need to be doing is caring for our body with the bigger view that we're caring for everything when we do that. And then we can have the right bhava, the right sense, the right orientation when we're caring for our body. That the sense of openness, the sense of porousness that is filled with devotion and love instead of the self-protectiveness. I want to become as strong as possible. I never want to get sick, etc. That is reinforcing ego, reinforcing a feeling of separateness. We all come into this world with a certain configuration. Every single one of us has been sick and every single one of us will get sick again. And the aim of self-care is not to never get sick. The aim of self-care is to work with what we have and use whatever we have to discover our real nature and discover our reality every process that we find ourselves engaged in. We should recognize that whatever illness we have is for our benefit. Not in a gooey, new agey way, but in the sense that this whole life process is going towards self-realization. So everything that happens here is going in that direction eventually. What makes the difference is how we work with it. We're not living in aphorisms. Oh, my illness is just an opportunity for this, you know. <laughs> we have to be real about things. We need to engage with pain and discover pain when we're feeling pain. That's the way to discover your nature. We need to keep bringing everything onto the path and investigating it and working with it with our practice in a real way, in a grounded way. And we're not always going to succeed, and that's okay too. Because we're all mixed bags, you know? We're all a mixture of sincerity and insincerity. And that's <coughs> just the human condition, and it's perfectly fine. <laughs> I'll say two last things. One of the major reasons we care for ourselves, other than the ones I've already mentioned, is because we want to die in a way that helps us to have a more conscious death. And if we spend our lives running our bodies into the ground and living in a way that is not in tune with nature, then we will just die by exhaustion. And we will have very little energy left to go through the bardos of death with any hope of being aware. But if we conserve our energy throughout our lifetime and live in a healthy way, make choices that help us to self-realize during our lifetime and build up that pattern, that samskara, then when we die, even if we're not high practitioners, we will still have some of the energy left to at least think of our mantra or think of our guru or do something, you know, even if we're not going to be fully awake 
in the bardas uh, and be you know enlightened masters we again you know in, in this country we're such titans we always think we have to like achieve these huge things really in great contrast to our actual condition <laughs> but wouldn't it be great if you could die in a way that you could be thinking of your teacher or being in a state of guru yoga or saying your mantra just being like that while you're going through those bardas that's just such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful result of a lifetime of practice. So that's really very important in these traditions. I want to give you even a bigger view than the one I just gave you of health and sickness. And this is also from Nanamaima. She said, there are two ways um, in which God bestows his grace, by favor and also by disfavor. In the world, there's both good and bad. Whatever path is right and proper for anyone, that is the path God will choose. This can be in the shape of disease, of kriya, meaning activity, of work. In every shape, God's grace can be perceived. Now look at it from yet another angle. Who hits whom? Who is ill? Who is ill? Illness and health, she's saying, are both experiences of Shiva nature. They are, they are equal. They are equal. That you see sickness, she said, that you see sickness is an error. Only God alone is present everywhere. In the final realization, there is no sickness. There is only this ever-changing palette of experiences of Shiva nature. Consciousness and energy does not get the flu. There's just that experience, that collection of different sensory experiences. So we are still working at this level. You know, we're, we are not experiencing illness the way Nanamayama did. She, these illness, she was ill many times. She, did, she said, no matter what condition I'm in, no matter what is, I'm ill or healthy, it's, I'm always fine. She said, this body is always very well. Whatever happens is exactly as it should be. Shiva nature is always exactly as it should be. So there's really never anything wrong. It's not like, oh, nothing's wrong, I'll ignore my health. Let me go eat five gallons of ice cream and drink a cask of beer. <laughs> we work with our bodies on the relative plane because that's where we live. And we are not, you know, ma yet. But it's good to understand because instead of going, oh, woe is me, oh, why did this happen, oh, what's wrong, oh, I'm terrible, or someone else is terrible, you know, someone gave me a cold, these things we get very pissed off, or I'm sick, I must not be doing something right. Instead of all that, we can keep in our mind that these are just spontaneously arising experiences of Shiva nature. And we're working with them as human beings and human bodies. And we're doing our best. So we should always be doing our best to be working with these arisings of Shiva nature. According to Ayurveda, according to the seasons, according to all of the wisdom that we have in our lives to work with. With the idea in mind that everything that we do in terms of self-care with the right attitude, the right view, is our spiritual practice. We are taking everything as spiritual practice. Everything that happens to us and understanding that it's an arising of Shiva nature and that sickness itself is just a concept for an experience that we're really having. Uh, we can relax even when we're sick. We can relax even when we're sick. So even illness can become a vehicle for relaxation with that view 
held in our hearts and minds. Jayakula is a nonprofit community offering opportunities to learn and practice in the direct realization traditions of Trika Shaivism and Dzogchen. We are based in Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Visit jayakula.org to explore more of our offerings.